morning. Hey, I think God's got something for you this morning. I couldn't have written a community meditation to go with my sermon any better if I had tried. The Great Commission. You know, and Rex and I don't talk about that. Nobody knows what I'm preaching on, usually. I don't even know a lot of times. Uh, no, it's amazing how God does that. But So the, the sermon I'm going to preach this morning, um, it's, it's taken from one that was done by Charles Spurgeon. And uh, I've added a lot of stuff. It's not exactly like it. If you want to listen to his version done better than mine, it, it's called uh, Do You Know Him? And so I'm, I'm going to challenge you this morning, a little bit like Rex did. You know, the Great Commission is a challenge to go into all the world and make disciples of all men. And so today I'm going to challenge you with three questions. I've got a few other questions, but I've got three main questions that I'm going to ask you. And, and so I want you... I'm not challenging you because I think that you're not there. I'm challenging you to make you think because if we get idle, it's not good. Um, so how many people here know Jesus? Yes, hopefully all of us. Okay, my first question is how do you know him? How do you know him? You know, I, I know a lot of people. Does anybody here know Donald Trump? Well, we know of Donald Trump. If I saw Donald Trump on the street, I would know who he is. But he doesn't know me. And, and I could walk up to him, and he would be nice because he wants me to vote for him, but I know Donald Trump because I know about Donald Trump. Is that how we know Jesus? Or what about... Well, what about a person we meet? Say we walk to work every day. And we meet a person on the street. And when we first meet them, you know, we're like, hey, how are you? And, and the, the, every day when I go to work, then you stop and you start talking to the person. And you get to know the person pretty well. And you actually get to where you might be able to ask them for a favor. I mean, I've got a couple people that I've asked for huge favors here lately. They're both sitting right here. Because they've spent a bunch of time in my wife's office putting flooring down, Aaron and and Joe, uh, good friends. But you'd get to where you'd be able to meet this person. If you needed help with something, you might be able to say, hey, could I help you with this? Or could you help me with this? And uh, Is that how we know Jesus? We come and we see Jesus once a week, and we kind of feel like we kind of know him, and if we ask him for something, sure, he'd help us out. But you know, then, then a relationship like that can turn into a closer friend relationship to where, to where you might have them over for supper. Or you might have them, you might take them out to a restaurant and go to dinner. And you sit down over food and you talk back and forth and, and you get to know what they think and they get to know what you think. And then maybe, maybe for all the holidays and birthday parties, you know, you spend time with this person and you get to know them pretty well. And you get to where you kind of could guess what they were going to do, and they'd kind of know what you were going to do, and you know you can depend on them. Maybe we know Christ like that. Maybe we spend time with him like that. And then, according to Charles Spurgeon, I like this. Let's say, let's say, I, have some, let's say I have Joe over to my house, and, uh, and Joe's getting ready to leave, and I'm in the other room doing something. He's getting ready to leave. And Joe goes, tells Tammy, he said, man, your husband, he's a great guy. You know what my wife, my wife would look at him and say, well, you know what, you don't know him like I do. You know, Christ calls us his bride, the church. Do you know him like your spouse? Could you imagine, could you imagine a friendship even if you didn't talk to them very often, now I've got some friends that we have been good friends and they've moved away and we can pick up where we left off, but for the most of a part, the friendship revolves around communicating with that person. And a spouse is communicating daily. Do you know Christ like that? You know, John 15, 15 and 16 
says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. Jesus calls us friends. Jesus called the disciples friends. No longer are we servants because, because why? Because Jesus has made everything about the kingdom known to us. We know exactly what he's doing. We know exactly why he's doing it. If we choose to communicate with him and we choose to get in the word and study and understand. But that doesn't happen by accident. Just like a good friendship doesn't happen by accident. A good marriage sure doesn't happen by accident. So let me ask you, how do you know him? Do you know him like a friend that you meet on the street once a week? Maybe once a day? Do you know him like a friend where you communicate seriously several times, maybe a week? Or do you know him like a spouse where you communicate with him daily and you, you understand what he's thinking? My wife, she's really good at reading my mind. I'm not so good with her. But I, I try sometimes. But Christ wants us to have a relationship like our spouse with him. Actually, if we really look at it, how does God know us? Well, it says that he knew us when we were still in the womb. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And I don't think we can get to know God that way, but I think we should try. So that's the first question. How do you know him? In what manner? How much time do you spend with him? Do you know what he's going to say sometimes before he says it? Do you study his word to know the heart of who he is? Or do we just come in here, sit down, and let somebody tell us what we need to know, and then go out and think that's sufficient, and we go out our separate ways? Do you know him better, or do you know him or the Bible better today than you did yesterday? Are you growing with him? You know, my wife and I, or even Joe and I, for the short time I've known Joe, we have such a stronger relationship, and I know, I know more about Joe, and I know more about Aaron than I did just a short time ago, just because I'm a friends with them, and I spend time with them, and every time we're around, I know them a little bit more. Every time I'm around Christ, every time I open the word, I know him a little bit more. If I don't, what am I doing? If I hung around with Joe and we didn't learn anything about each other, what kind of friends are we? We ask questions, we talk. It's not always serious, but we just, we learn things about each other. So, my second question is, are you growing in Christ? Do you know him better today than you did yesterday? Do you know him better today than you did a year ago? Man, if you have a friend that's a friend for 15 years, you communicate without talking. It's You just learn who they are, and you're around them, and you know their personality, you know who they are. If you're not growing in him, why not? Okay, now let's turn to Matthew 13. And we're going to come back to John here in a little bit. We're going to talk about the parable of the sower this morning. Matthew 13, 1 through 9. I love parables. And I love the way, right, right during this part, at least the way that Matthew writes it, Jesus tells part of a parable, and then he goes to something else, and then he come back, comes back and explains it. And it's like he gives them a little bit of time for everything to soak in. And it, but uh, Matthew 13, 1 through 9, it says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and a great multitude were gathered together to him, so that we got into a boat, so he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, 
Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on the stony places, where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up, and because they had no depth of and they immediately sprang up, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no roots, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But the others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. You know, the cool thing about parables is he's telling us what the kingdom of heaven is like, because so many parables start with the kingdom of heaven is like. And a lot of times he says, blessed is the person who understands. He who has ears, let him hear. It's just cool the way Jesus teaches. I mean, uh, so then he goes on, he talks about something else, but then in, in 18, he comes back and he explains this. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches it away, uh, snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives this is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony place, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So the first one's people that, you know, you spread the gospel with and they don't even accept it. They just... It doesn't even sink in and start to grow. Then you got the people that they receive it and everything seems to be going really good and it just falls on shallow soil so it doesn't grow. And it just kind of, they give up. Uh, now the next two are interesting. He who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke the, choke the word and he becomes unfruitful but he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold some sixtyfold and some thirtyfold so, so the one that grows on the good soil but it has thorns in it Okay, that's the people that because of life, because of money, because of all these deceitful things, they start growing, they come to church, they do everything, and I think a lot of them remain in church, honestly. I think a lot of these people remain in church, and they just, how do they know him? Well, the cares of this world become more important in Christ and there's a distinct difference between this person which is probably still in church it's just they don't put Christ in the place they should put him and the one that is on the good soil and that is if you look in verse 22 he becomes unfruitful now Look at what happens in 23 at the end. Those who understand it, they indeed bear fruit, and it produces some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Now, go back to John. If you would, honey, I know I didn't put it in there in the order, but go back to John 16. Now, when Jesus says, We are friends, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. What was, what was Rex saying up here this morning? He said the Great Commission, Jesus' last words, are to go into all the world and make disciples of all men. You know, a disciple isn't just a follower. We, we've got it in our head that we're disciples of Christ because we follow Christ, but a disciple 
follows Christ and gets to such a place to where they turn around and they disciple somebody else. And there's somebody doing some discipling or you wouldn't be here today. And if you think, and I tell my Sunday school class this all the time, if you think that you can think of at least three people in your life that have brought you to the knowledge of Christ and that's why you're sitting here today. Might be a preacher. And, and I know a lot of people, a lot of preachers that do that. But most likely, there's at least two people in your life that are personal friends of yours or relatives of yours that poured into you and brought you to the knowledge of Christ to be here today. Are you doing that for somebody else? Are you producing fruit? That's my next question. Do you produce fruit? That's the difference between the people stuck in the world being choked out by thorns and the people that are following Christ that are on the good soil. The people on the good soil produce fruit. They are, and it doesn't say, it says 100-fold, 60-fold, or 30-fold. It doesn't matter. I don't care if it's somebody where you're leading thousands of people to Christ or if you've got two people you're working with right now. If you're a follower of Christ, you are producing fruit. If you're not producing fruit, you need to sit down and you take a look at yourself and go, why am I even going to church? And then again, Rex nailed it with the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preaching the gospel, that you might win them all. I can't believe he used that scripture. It kind of blew my mind when I was sitting here listening to him do that because it fits so well. I think God has a message for us this morning. How do you know him? How much time do you spend with him? If he was your spouse, would you still be married? Are we growing with him all the time? Man, I know my wife so much better now than I did 30 years ago when we got married. She probably wouldn't marry me today. But no, you grow together. You know them. I know her in such a way that is, the more time goes by, the better I know my wife. And we should hope to get to the point where we know God like God knows us. That is our goal. I don't think we'll get there in this world, but that's what we should strive for. Are you growing in Him? Are you going to know Him better tomorrow than you do today? Do you produce fruit? Three questions that I want you to think about this week. That's the way the gospel spread, is that the, the Christian people went out and spread the word. It wasn't the apostles that did it all. That's our job. That's what being a follower of Christ is, is loving people enough to spread the gospel and loving him enough to spread his word to the world. That's the definition of a disciple of Christ. Not that we just follow him and come to church. Now, I want to take a look real quick. I'm just about done. Uh, but I want to take a look real quick in Matthew 24. Uh, nope, I'm sorry. Matthew 13, we're still in 13, 24 through 30. Now we're talking about the tares and the wheat. And another parable put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, so this is the kingdom of heaven, this is what heaven's like. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while the men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Now, now then, does it have, how then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. 
Now in 36, 43, or it's 36 to 43, he explains this. It says, Then Jesus went to the multitude away and went into his house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares and you know, of, of the field. Sorry. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all the things that offend and those who participate in lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of, furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So I find it kind of interesting that he's talking about the parable of the sower, and then he turns around and talks about how the tares and the wheat will be separated at the end, but we're not going to pull the tares out for at the time being because we don't want to hurt the wheat. So I think there's people in churches today that are like the people that are in, like the third one that he talked about, where the, the, the weeds and everything grow up and they entangle them, and, and God's just like, leave them in the churches, leave everything just fine, we'll, we'll deal with this in the end. But one of these days, the people that produce fruit are going to be separated from the people that do not produce fruit. And I don't think it's an accident that this parable of the the tares and the wheat is right after the parable of the sower. But it's not our place, it's not our place to say, well, you're a tear, we're going to get you out of here. I'm not qualified to make that call, for one. So all I can say is, are you producing fruit or are you not producing fruit? Because if we're not producing fruit, I'm afraid that the parable of the tares applies to us. So, are you spreading the word somewhere? Are you growing in him? Are we furthering the gospel? Or are we coming to church and we're just comfortable? If the praise band would come forward, um, we are wrapping up. It does good to be challenged every once in a while. Um, I'm going to have another sermon. It's going to be a challenging sermon next week also. So, but it, I just want to, I just want us to think: Where are we at? Are we just taking? Are we just along for the ride? Because when I read the Bible to the followers of Christ, there is a specific purpose for His followers, and that is to love Him, to get to know Him, to be friends with Him, and to spread His word. That seems to be one of the things that he plugged the most. Spread my word. Feed my sheep. Go into all the world. So, just as a recap, and then I'm done. How do you know him? What kind of a relationship do you have with your Lord and Savior? Are you growing in him daily? And do you produce fruit? Those three questions. Think about those this week. Um, we're going to open it up. If anybody wants to come forward as we sing, and we're going to sing an old-time hymn, the old rugged cross today. So, yeah, Dr Curtis, you sing loud, Curtis. <laughs> but if you feel the need to come forward, um, come down here. We'll have an elder or deacon, or we'll have people uh, pray with you. And Anyway, we'll get started. Mm -hmm.